Thank you so much. Hi. Honored to be here and uh, very nice to be talking about TCAR, something I think I've become quite passionate about in recent years. Um, how do we go? Oh, is this thing here? All right. So I have the following disclosures. Um, really, it's just that I'm involved in a number of carotid revascularization trials, including the TCAR DWI trial, which is sponsored by Silk Road Medical, which makes the TCAR system. So in terms of an outline, we're going to talk a little bit about the rationale and options for carotid revascularization. We're going to talk about the evidence for TCAR, and there is evidence, and it is growing. And I think we're kind of getting to a point, especially at the end of 2019, where we can't just completely ignore that data set. And then how has this really impacted my practice? So we all know in this audience that carotid stenosis is an important stroke etiology. And really the trials that, were, that came out in the 1980s and the mid-1990s really established carotid revascularization as an important form of secondary stroke prevention, especially for symptomatic greater than 50% carotid stenosis. This is one of my favorite figures about carotid disease in the carotid literature, and it's the Peter Rothwell um, pooled analysis of the NASA at ECST and Veterans Affairs Cooperative Study, those trials from the 80s and 90s. And essentially what it shows is that <clears throat> there's a significant absolute risk reduction um, of carotid endarterectomy at preventing an ipsilateral ischemic stroke, any operative stroke or operative death, and that's durable, so that, that effect lasts over time, and that's what those different columns are in each of the percentage stenosis bins. There's a nice linear relationship between the degree of uh, efficacy of the procedure and the amount of percentage stenosis, such that for greater than 70% carotid stenosis, the number needed to treat is quite low, it's six, where it's still significant or still an important effect, but smaller, so it's a higher number needed to treat for 50 to 69% stenosis. That's the data set that really established carotid endarterectomy as the gold standard for carotid revascularization. And you add to that that for surgeons, carotid endarterectomy is actually a fun surgery to do. So you have something that's efficacious and it's enjoyable for the surgeon. But there are a number of you know, issues that are related to carotid endarterectomy. One is that there's some important nerves, and you see here the hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve 12 draped about a centimeter, centimeter and a half above the um, bifurcation. Um, and that can be damaged or um, you know, injured, given cranial neuropathies. You can have hoarse voice from damage or stretching of other nerves. But at its core, an endarterectomy is a very nice procedure also because in theory you're removing all the atheromatous material and you're leaving this nice clean uh, intimal surface. One of the downsides from a technique point of view of carotid endarterectomy is that you have to manipulate the carotid lesion, right? So you have to get control of all the vessels above and below and therefore you have to manipulate the lesion at this area of potentially friable plaque, especially for symptomatic carotid disease. I like to think of endovascular as like the coolest stuff. It's like continuously evolving, continuously improving outcomes. But in this recently published paper by Muller and all in 2019, they actually looked at the improvement in periprocedural stroke rates from carotid angioplasty and stenting transfemorally and carotid endarterectomy in four randomized controlled trials that are listed over here on the left. And what they actually found was that the percentage of patients that had strokes after carotid endarterectomy fell between 2000 and 2008, which is the recruitment period for these particular trials. So the risk of having a stroke related to carotid endarterectomy is low. So this is a very effective procedure. <clears throat> Whereas for carotid angioplasty and stenting, the trial data would suggest that it's higher, and we didn't see as much of a fall as we did in the endarterectomy group. It wasn't statistically significant. This is the big problem with transfemoral CAS right? It's the risk of stroke. And I would argue that one of the main reasons for that has to do with the technique itself. So the first thing is you have to navigate the arch, and that can be not only tedious and time-consuming, but also potentially hazardous in terms of flicking off um, atheromatous material in the arch. You have to cross the lesion once unprotected to get a distal embolic protection device in place. And this distal, distal embolic protection device isn't 100% effective. It can be tipped, it can be jostled, it can be bumped, 
thereby spilling embolic debris, which I think accounts for the higher rate of stroke, periprocedural stroke, than carotid endarterectomy in the, ran in the randomized controlled trials. TCAR addresses many of these concerns. So it's a small incision that's below the atheromatous lesion. So the atheromatous lesion never has to be manipulated like in an endarterectomy. You directly cannulate the carotid artery and then below that clamp the vessel, which when you create an extracorporeal shunt, which you can see down here on the right in the lower panel, you attach the artery to a femoral vein with a filter in the middle of the circuit. And so when you place the clamp on the carotid uh, artery below where you've punctured it, you basically create flow reversal in the carotid tree, in the carotid artery. And when you perform your angioplasty and stenting procedure under flow reversal. So this again addresses the, you don't need to navigate the arch. You don't need to cross the lesion unprotected. You don't need to manipulate the bulb. So it has a lot of theoretical advantages. What's the evidence? Does this actually work? <clears throat> So the pivotal trial was called the Roadster trial, and it took patients that were high risk for carotid endarterectomy, and it looked at their 30-day outcomes. And if you just focus on the all-stroke column, you see that the all-stroke column is only 1.4%, so that's extremely low. In fact, it's the lowest stroke rate ever reported in a carotid stenting prospectively collected data set. And if you compare that to the rate of all-stroke in the CREST study, for CEA it was 2.3%, and for CAS, transfemoral, it was 4.1%. And so, again, significantly lower. <clears throat> and again, these are for high surgical risk patients. There was a breakdown between symptomatic and asymptomatic. So although the majority were, in fact, asymptomatic, there was an important number of symptomatic patients included in the study um, as well. They just reported their one-year outcomes, and these are not surprisingly durable results because at its core, it's like any other stentic procedure, and so it's protective over an extended period of time. The risk of having an ipsilateral stroke over the next year is very low. Now we're starting to get other series of data sets that are coming out on much larger numbers of TCAR procedures. One of the data sets is from the Society of Vascular Surgeries um, VQI registry, so Vascular Quality Initiative registry. And in this particular paper, they looked at over 600 TCARs and compared them to over 10,000 transfemoral carotid angioplasty and stenting procedures. And this is like a real world scenario, right? So this isn't necessarily only high risk patients, not necessarily only symptomatic patients, but patients that need revascularization in everybody's practice here today. What they essentially found, and this was used rigorous statistical methods in terms of matching and controlling for different factors, was that the risk of all stroke and TIA, or the composite of stroke, TIA, and death, was twice as likely in the transfemoral carotid angioplasty and strengthening group compared to the group that had the TCAR procedure. So again, recapitulating very much the data from the Roadster study. <clears throat> and if you break out symptomatic and asymptomatic carotid stenosis, um, in terms of how these patients presented to medical attention, you can see that uh, it holds true for both groups of patients, both symptomatic and asymptomatic carotid stenosis, nearly 1.5 to two-fold reductions in periprocedural stroke rates. These are in-hospital stroke rates for this particular study. The likely reason for this is not only all the things that I mentioned before, but also this very powerful neuroprotection strategy. And so what this study looked at was they took patients that were going to undergo transfemoral CAS, TCAR, or CEA, and did transcranial Doppler ultrasonography. And they looked at the incidence of embolic phenomena at different times during the procedure, either pre-protection, protection, or post-protection. And what they found was that the number of embolic hits in CAS was much higher than for CEA or TCAR which really is coincident with the data that we just presented, and very much coincident with some of the randomized control data where MRIs were performed after these procedures. This is, for example, the ICSS randomized control trial comparing CAS versus CEA, and it showed that three times, there's three times more patients in the stenting group than in the endoterectomy group that had DWI hits post-treatment. So how do we use all this data today? So I happen to be fortunate enough to do all these types of procedures. We started doing TCAR in 2016, and you can see that my rate of CAS steadily fell over time 
endarterectomy sort of leveled out at about 20 to 25 percent, whereas at our institution now, we do far more TCARs than the other two procedures combined. And I think that most centers are going to end up in some sort of paradigm that's similar to this.